of your scriptures. So pray today we come to your word with a prepared heart, with an open mind, with a willingness to receive from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome everyone to our part six in our series, All About Love. And our topic today is Love Always Hopes. Love Always Hopes. It's the final in the series. But let me read the whole passage that we've been working through over the last six weeks. First Corinthians 13, seven verses. First seven verses. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I might boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love is eternal. Just moving into verse 8 there. Love is eternal. Well, let me say a little bit about this phrase. Love always hopes. This uh, word hopes it's a fantastic Greek word. It's um, when we see the word hopes in our New Testament, often it is this word, elpizo, elpizo in the Greek. And it means literally this, to hope, to hope for, to put hope in, expect, an attitude of confidently looking forward to what is good and beneficial. Um, we also, of course, see the word hope in the scripture without the S. And uh, it's often this word, the Greek word is translate, which is translated hope, is LPs, LPs. And uh, it means literally positive expectation or all hope. Now, as we go through a whole variety of passages with the word hope in them in the New Testament today, it's either one of those two words every time. Now, um, one, of the, one of the guys I quoted from last week, I'm going to quote him again this week, is our... Um, very solid theologian, Leon Morris, the late Leon Morris, who a great scholar of the word of God. He says this about the word. He says, always hopes, this phrase, always hopes. This is not an unreasoning optimism which fails to take account of reality. It is rather a refusal to take failure as final. It is the confidence that looks to ultimate triumph by the grace of God. Let me read that again. Always hopes, this is not an unreasoning optimism which fails to take account of reality. It is rather a refusal to take failure as final. It is the confidence that looks to ultimate triumph by the grace of God. Uh, To quote someone else who uh, Charles Swindle quotes actually when talking about this area of hope, someone who's certainly not a theologian, the author of Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain says this, we can survive weeks without hope, days without water. So we can survive weeks without food, days without water, minutes without oxygen, he says, but only seconds without hope. How do we discover the hope that Christian love produces? That's my big question. How do we discover the hope that Christian love produces? Well, I'm going to give you some principles today. First of all, let's have a look here at the book of Romans 15.4. It says this, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So first of all, hope comes from the scriptures. Number one, hope comes from the scriptures. That's an important source. Um, And so I'd always say to people, hey, you've got to get the word of God into your life. However that might be, you're, you're reading the word, you're studying the scriptures, you're meditating on the, the word of God, and whether that's um, through a hard copy Bible, whether that's on your phone or, or however you're doing it. And of course, there's other creative ways as well. One of the things that um, I often do is I'll, I'll listen to the uh, NIV dramatised version. So you just search NIV, dramatised, and um, go to YouTube. And, you, and it, well, I like it is because it's actors and it's got sound effects, so it brings it to life. Still word for word from the NIV, but it just gives a little more life to it. Uh, I know Lisa, like, she goes to bed listening to sermons regularly, and she'll often wake up in the middle of the night, and the guy's just quoting a verse, and it'll just speak to her right at that moment, relevant at that time. Um, uh, One of the things that I do, I've just been doing at the moment, actually, is uh, 
One of my favourite Jesus movies is the classic Jesus of Nazareth. Um, it was a film actually that came out in 1977, but it was one of the most critically acclaimed ones. So a miniseries. In fact, I, I bought it recently. I used to have a couple of copies of it. It seemed to have gone missing. I re-bought it recently about, I don't know, a month ago. And I went to JB Hi-Fi and I just looked in the, the J section. You couldn't find it anywhere. I went to the desk and uh, the, uh, the lady said, oh, this, this lady over here will find it for you. So she went, up, went off and found it. And she said, oh, no, it's in the new release section. They've re-released it about four days ago. <laughs> but and I love that version, but partly it's because it's, I think it's so well directed and acted. Eight of the key actors have Academy Awards. So, you know, it's, uh, okay, it would have been a pretty big budget film, I imagine, at the time. But I listen to that at the moment. I've been watching it, but I've also just been listening to it at night. And because the guy who plays Jesus... I mean, probably 70% of everything he says is directly from Scripture, but he's a brilliant actor as well, so it really brings it to life. So I've been listening to that, driving Pamela mad, um, nearly every night. <laughs> so I listen to it all night. <laughs> Goes for 6.5 hours, so here's another one. Let's have a look at Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, hope comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe that there are things we can do, of course, to allow God's Spirit to work more in our lives. And one of them is exactly what we've been doing this morning, singing songs of worship. So often people connect with God that way. I remember Carol saying to me just recently that often we'll get to one of the worship songs and she'll just start crying. She doesn't know why, but she knows God is connecting with her and doing something in her heart. Um, of course, another key area is, um, is prayer. And uh, someone was saying actually the Alpha Table, one of the things they find difficult with prayer is just the busyness of life. They'll go to pray at night and they're just off to sleep in no time. you know. And uh, I remember one of my jobs... Um, Oh, it was, uh, I got saved when I was working here, but uh, it, was a, it was two different shifts alternated each week. But the early morning shift, you had to be there at seven, so I had to get up pretty early. You could still got to drive there. And I remember I was a new Christian, and uh, the pastor had taught about quiet times, and so I tried to meet with God for 30 minutes in the morning. And I remember trying to pray, and it's like you're sitting by the heater, especially in winter, and it's like just dropping off all the time. And so I ended up thinking, you know what? I want a prayer walk. You know, so put a big jacket on and off I went, you know, and I'd, just, I'd walk for 30 minutes in the morning before I went off to work um, and just pray that way. And I was memorising scripture as well, so I'd often just be memorising verses as I did that. But uh, the idea is worship and prayer. Listen to worship songs, you know, find a scenic place and pray. I often would uh, often have prayed around lakes and that sort of place where you're out in God's creation, but actually right here in this auditorium too. I often, um, uh, Wednesdays is fairly quiet in here, and it's often the day I'll prepare the message. And so I'll actually just, I'll just be walking around this auditorium, worshipping God, might sing some songs of praise, um, may read some psalms of praise, and just pray and allow God by his spirit to work in the heart. And sometimes that work is, of course, bringing hope. So let's make those things a priority. If we want hope in our lives, the scriptures and the Holy Spirit are going to be essential. But let's look at some others as well. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.3 is an interesting verse. It says, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's an interesting thought. Number three, hope can inspire endurance. Hope can inspire endurance. And in fact, um, the main passage we've been dealing with put the two phrases right next to each other. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love always hopes, always perseveres. Um, can I suggest this? When we have a positive expectation of the future, we are better equipped to persevere. Let me say that again. When we have a positive expectation of the future, we are better equipped to persevere. Uh, a related point, let's have a look at this here. Romans uh, 12, 11, it says this. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That's an interesting phrase, right? Be joyful in hope. Can I suggest this number four? Hope can produce joy. Hope can produce joy. 
Um, you know, it's difficult to have joy in your heart if you're feeling negative about the future, because hope is very related to the future. Very difficult to have joy in your heart if you're feeling negative about the future. First Timothy 6.17 says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they might take hold of the life that is truly life. So here Paul writes to Pastor Timothy, giving him some advice about how to teach his congregation. And he's saying to Timothy, you know, when you're preaching, remind your congregation, don't put hope in temporary things. There's very much human nature to do that. And so whether that's financial, in this case, he's talking about financial security. You know, some of those wealthy guys in your church, Timothy, remind them that is not a secure place to to put their hope. But rather, he's saying, place your hope in the living God. And he even says about wealth, which is so uncertain. But the the truth is, every temporary thing is uncertain. Um, You you can't really place your hope in them. Things change. You know, um, let me suggest this. Number five, hope should not be misplaced. Hope should not be misplaced. People can put their hope in a fulfilling career, perhaps finishing that degree or PhD. They can put their hope in a person. Over the years, I've talked with a number of young adults, sometimes not young adults, and they've placed their hope in a person. Oh, if I can just go out with that girl, if I can just marry that guy, you know, and there's an enormous amount of hope placed in that. Um, for others, it, it may be something completely different that I haven't mentioned at all. But you're placing a lot of hope in that rather than the living God. The reality is what Paul is saying, the temporal things can disappoint, but God won't. Let me um, add to that with Romans 5.5. 5. And the hope that does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Wow. God pours that hope into our hearts. It doesn't disappoint. Moving on, it says in 1 John 3, 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what, we, and what we will be has not been made known. But we will know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. I remember Pastor Kim Valentine, the first pastor uh, where I was attending church, he used to uh, preach from the pulpit sometimes, you know, if you want, to, you want to live a holy life, be expectant of Jesus' return. And there's no reason, in fact, we're encouraged in the scriptures to be expectant Jesus could return any day, any day. And he said, if that is your expectation, when you are faced with temptation, you are less likely to fall. Can I suggest this? Number six, hope of Christ's return gives us power over sin. Hope of Christ's return gives us power over sin. A lot of people doing their taxes around this time of year. No one or two good tax jokes. There's this Aussie fella, and um, when he'd uh, filled out his tax return, he'd, he'd excluded about 50,000 of, of his earnings. And um, then he got saved. And he, he was finding he couldn't sleep at night. He kept feeling guilty about being dodgy with his tax. And so in the end, he thought, look, oh, I don't know. I've got to get rid of this guilt. So he, and he, he takes out 2000 in cash, puts it in the envelope with a handwritten letter, sends it off to the taxation department and explains in the letter without leaving any of his details, I've been feeling so guilty about uh, not owning up to this tax. I'm sending you this money. And then in very small writing, he says, P.S., If I still feel guilty, I'll send you the rest. (laughs) Six points we've had a look at so far today. 
Number one, hope comes from the scriptures. Two, hope comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. Three, hope can inspire endurance. Four, hope can produce joy. Five, hope should not be misplaced. And six, hope of Christ's return can give us power over sin. But you know, there's one previous step that needs to take place before all of this. And it's found in uh, Colossians 1.21. Let's have a look at these words. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. The hope held out in the gospel. That's the beginning of Christian hope, is first accepting, believing in the gospel. You know, I, um, I remember uh, just reflecting this uh, week about a chap I led to Christ in, in Britain. And I remember in his testimony, he used the word hope. You know, it was very, very deep in his story of coming to faith in Christ. And uh, he was a guy who um, I met the second week at church. Um, we had a kind of a newcomer's area at the back of our auditorium and a kind of a bunch of tall, round coffee tables. We kind of sat on stools. And, um, you know, so we had nice coffee and niblets and cakes and slices and stuff there. Anyway, so he'd been invited over, and he'd come over to the newcomer's area, and Pastor Laura, my pastoral care pastor, introduced me to him. Uh, his name was Shane. And so I get chatting with Shane, and I said, well, tell me, Shane, how, how do you come to be at church today? And uh, Shane says to me, well, last week, so the Sunday previous, he said, my friend and I were looking for a coffee shop. And we just stand in this big queue, you know, for a while. And we thought, well, I'm I'm not going here. (laughs) Forget it. We'll go somewhere else. And they ended up at the early cafe. The early cafe was immediately across from my church, Whitcliffe Baptist, uh, in a busy area called Cemetery Junction. Anyway, um, Whitcliffe had worked very hard on their profile. They were extremely well known in the community. Anyway, uh, he's, he's there looking at this church, drinking his coffee, looking at the church, and he, and he was there Sunday morning, you know, and uh, we had four services Sunday. The 10.45 service was about to start. And he said, all these people pile into the church. And he said, I felt, I felt strangely drawn, you know. And I, I kind of was, was looking for something. I'd had a couple of friends die. And um, I, I just thought, you know, I was just feeling, I was feeling depressed. I was feeling kind of sad. And I was just looking, you know, the, the, the futility of life was kind of, you know, there. And uh, I've never done church. You know, the only time I ever went to church was a wedding or a funeral. And I thought, oh, stuff it, I'll go. You know, and he walked across, you know, the, the busy intersection area when the lights changed and in he came. And that was the week before. And I said, oh, well, how did you, how did you find it the last couple of weeks? And he said, well, I, I love the worship songs, you know. I, he'd never heard them before, just songs like we're singing today. And he just said, I don't know, I just felt, I felt like good when you guys were singing those songs. And I said, do you know much about Christianity? And he said, well, not really, no. I said, let me explain something to you. And I, I turned over one of our brochures to the side that had nothing on it and pulled out a pen. And I drew a couple of these, uh, couple of cliffs. And, um, and then I wrote the word God on one side. Like this. And the other side, I drew an extremely um, talented picture of a, of a dude. Here he is. He commented immediately on my artwork, as you can imagine. And I said, you know, a lot of people feel like there's some sort of gap, a distance between them and God. And he said, that's exactly how I feel. And I, then I added, a lot of people try and bridge that gap in a whole variety of ways. He was a, quite a wealthy guy, businessman. I said, some people try and bridge the gap by being generous, you know, giving away money to charities. Other people might try and, you know, bridge that gap by doing good works. Let's write a GW there for good works. Um, some people might say, well, it's not enough to do good things, you need to be good. And they might say, oh, well, look, so I'm going to bridge that gap by being a morally upright person. And so they try and be a good person. Another person might try and bridge that gap by using some form of religion. And I said to him, 
But, you know, none of those things will actually bridge the gap. So he's listening away. And I said, you know, the thing that really creates that blockage, that distance, is actually this word here. It's just a little word, but it's quite profound. And I wrote down the bottom here the word sin. And I said, sin's basically all the shortcomings, all the failings, the things that we know that we're, we're not really doing right. And we, we feel that sense in which, hey, Lou, I know I'm not perfect. There's some stuff I don't feel too good about. Well, it's that stuff in our lives that creates this separation. Do you know much about Easter, mate? And he says, um, yeah, well, I know that, like, you know, that's the time that Christians remember Jesus died on a cross. And I said, um, do you know why he died? He said, well, it was like he was, um, wasn't he executed unjustly, like he'd been a good person, but, you know, anyway, they, they killed him, false accusations and all that. And I said, yeah, that's, that's right. But there's more to it than that. Jesus actually said, he predicted that he would die on the cross, and he said that he was going to bear the sins of humanity, that all those shortcomings we've been talking about, that in an extraordinary way, a a cosmic event would take place, this timeless event, that Jesus, outside of time or beyond time, he would bear the sins of everyone, past, present, and future. And he can only do that because he was the divine son of God. And so when he died... A supernatural thing happened. And I I drew a big picture of a cross, something like this. And I said, it's it's Jesus' death on the cross that actually can cancel out all this stuff. It can cancel out your sin. It takes away the need to try and bridge that gap in other ways. And um, ultimately then I uh, said to him that Jesus has made it possible for anyone to come into a relationship with God or to go to heaven. But I said, but they've got to cross over. And he then said to me, well, how do you do that? And I said, well, there's two things. It's believing that this stuff is real and it's inviting him into your life. And so I led him in a prayer, something like this. I simply said, actually the youth prayed this prayer on um, Friday night. Led him in a prayer saying something like this. Lord Jesus, I do believe you are the son of God. I I do believe you lived an amazing life to follow, but you also died a death on the cross, a death that... I don't fully understand, but here and today that you took away the sins of humanity, all my shortcomings and failings, I can be forgiven. I own up to the fact I'm not perfect. I've got sin in my life. I need your forgiveness. I invite you to come into my life this day. Would you come into my life? Would you lead my life? In Jesus' name, amen. So he just prayed that prayer with me. And then... I asked him how he felt. He said, oh, I feel good. I feel good. Now, you might say, well, that doesn't work. You just pray a little prayer. How is that really going to change your life? Well, the next week I did a salvation study with him, just spent some time with him. The week after that I did a baptism study with him. And then we worked on the testimony, which you've heard a bit about. I'll read a couple of things from his testimony. This is where the hope really comes in. He said... Um, After inviting Jesus into his life, his depression and sadness lifted and was replaced with hope. That was his words in his testimony. His depression and sadness lifted and was replaced with hope. Um, He said, I used to often be angry in the workplace and with people at work and stressed. Now I'm just so much more relaxed. I'm calmer. And he, he said, you know, when I come to this 1045 King's, King's Room church service, during the worship, I just feel, feel happy. I just feel so happy. And he, and he adds, he says, I've got a sense of hope that God is going to make me a better person. So along with five others, he was baptised a month after he came to church, which is actually much more the biblical way. People get saved, they should be baptised as soon as they're saved. That was the biblical pattern. And at Wycliffe, that was happening all the time. The church had a very high profile. We'd have people just coming in through the doors all the time. Everyone knew the church. 
And strangely, not just Christians, but unchurched people would just show up all the time. Let me make this point. Hope commences by accepting the gospel. Hope commences by accepting the gospel. We got that point seven. Let's just pop point seven up for a moment. We'll go back to the other pick. Hope commences by accepting the gospel. But let me talk a little bit about church, church profile for a moment. Let's put an image of our people up here. One of the things I believe that we need to think about is our church profile. Now, we've been trying to work on that this year. So we um, tried to relaunch the church in March, and we did that series, The Life and Teachings of Jesus. Big banner out in front of the church. We've got some roadside signage happening. Uh, we had a lot, bunch of brochures going out for that series. And then the pinnacle of the series, kind of the finish of it, was the follower, the Easter outreach production. And definitely, those things have helped raise our profile, but we need to keep on thinking about it. How can we raise our church profile? Churches grow because people know they exist. If they don't know you exist, you're never going to grow. You, people just don't come and visit. They don't really know you're around. I think our profile needs to be a lot higher. I've been in churches with really high profiles, and I know what it is to see a dozen people come in week after week, another dozen, another dozen. And obviously only perhaps one third of those are going to settle and join, but when you've got lots of people coming in because they know you're around, it makes a huge difference to growing and building. And, of course, a lot of this is about God's kingdom, not just Christians, because it's the unchurched that come in as well. Let me talk about an opportunity. So one of the, um, Kerry and I were just here at the office one day and uh, we have this chap come in. His name's Aaron Christian. And uh, he says, look, I've got an opportunity for you guys. So he just works for a signage company. They, they're in charge of all the signs, advertising signs at the railway stations. And uh, he says to me, We've got a, we've got a, we just sold one, but we've got a prime spot at the, at the local train station. I can see your church is close to the station. I see you've got a good website. I think you guys will get a lot of people through the doors if you have a look at this. So his suggestion to us that he has an image of the church, could be that sort of image or whatever image we do, but the size of the sign is, this is about one metre, just under. It's three metres across and about 1.3 metres high, so about three times the size of this. He suggested an image of your church that you want, um, QR code, so people just click on that, go to the website, North Church up the top, whatever else you want on there. And he said there's uh, close to one million people get on that train every year, um, or one of those trains every year at the Epping station. And he said, of course, there's buses as well. That doesn't include the people doing the bus thing. And it's right at the top of the stairs, so very high-profile area. Now, my leaning would be, actually, that could be a really good opportunity to raise the profile of our church, um, that particular station, because it's so close. Um, but, of course, all these things cost money. Raising profile, unfortunately, does cost money. Uh, so what their charge is, if we gave it a three-month trial, three months would be long enough, uh, you'd know if it's going to work within three months. Um, so but that's 750 bucks per month we pay for the privilege of having a sign there. And as well, it would, you've got to pay for the sign. So the initial outlay as well for the sign, which is oh, it's around about somewhere between twelve and 1400 so over 1000 bucks to create the sign as well. We, of course, get to keep the sign, but we would have to pay the initial outlay to create it. So something to think about. So it's around about $3,500 for that privilege of that trial. I think it could well be worth looking at. So we may well talk about that in our members' meeting. I don't want to miss out on the opportunity, though, I must admit, because someone else might snap it up, of course. Uh, there's just... They only have two. They've got legal right to have two signs there, uh, their company. But something to think about. But I think this is something to be praying into. God wants to bring people into this church, as he does any church, any church preaching the true word of God. He wants to bring them in. But every church has to think about, we've got to let people know we're here. And so every church needs to be considering that, and we, we certainly no exception. So I would encourage you to be thinking about how we can raise our profile. I've had one or two other good suggestions mentioned to me as well. Brett Kelly mentioned a good idea to me recently as well. Why don't we um, close our service at this point, trusting God and his grace. We'll um, have some great plans, some great hope for the future. I'm going to finish with this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. This is one that God's put in my heart for this church a number of times. Let me read it to you, and I'll read a couple of verses after it as well. 
29, 11 of Jeremiah, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Wow, plans to give you a hope and a future. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Let me call up Roxanne to close in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the message that we have heard today and and just pray, Lord, that we can take into our hearts that hope that you offer us. And I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear afresh that you offer that hope to each one of us as we reach out for it, Lord, that you give us a reason to look into the future with joy. And I just pray, Lord, for North Church and for us collectively, Father, that we will look at the future ahead with joy and hope and expectation. And we thank you, Lord, for your promises to us in your word. And pray, Lord, that we can take them on individually but corporately as well. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings, for your love, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, that through that cross we are given the hope that is beyond measure. And we thank you in Jesus' beautiful name.